one part of my background which I think wasn't touched upon, but that I'm very proud about, is that I was also a school teacher for a number of years. Um, and for another seven or eight years after that, I trained teachers, primary school teachers and secondary school teachers, um, inspected schools, um, and then became a psychologist, and then became uh, a neuroscientist. Um, but all the time, very much being concerned in my thoughts and in my feelings about the importance of education and still what happens in the classroom is the thing which is of most importance to me even though I spend most of my time now um, doing research. Some of that research is in the classroom, some of that research is using neuroimaging, looking, looking inside the brain. So I suppose that explains how I became so closely involved in this new adventure of joining neuroscience and education together. Um, and I'm here tonight in a way to try to persuade you that neuroscience and education do belong together. They need to talk to each other. We need an authentic dialogue that can be of benefit to both fields, but most importantly to our, our children. Okay, so um, it's divided into two parts, this talk. The first part is about neuromyth. The second part is about authentic ways in which neuroscience can support and illuminate education. Um, and these are my, my two basic arguments, really, that if neuroscience does not get involved with education and if educators do not learn about neuroscience, we're going to have more neuromyth. So an important part of having an authentic dialogue is to get rid of the neuromyth and the other important thing about a dialogue will be to introduce new ideas about how we learn, which can really make teaching and learning more effective and more productive. So let me say a little, a little about neuromyth. Um, it's not surprising that teachers are interested in ideas about the brain. We did this survey a few years ago. 90% of teachers think that it's important or very important in the design of educational programs. I think that reflects a natural enthusiasm. And it is natural, it should be natural, because teachers are the only professionals who, on a daily basis, are responsible for changing the function, the connectivity, and even the structure of the brain. Because when you learn something and you practice something long enough, it actually changes the shape of the different regions of the brain. And there's only one professional who is responsible for doing that on a daily basis, and that is the teacher. So it is natural that teachers should be interested. Um, but of course, that also makes it possible for that enthusiasm to be exploited um, and sometimes for misunderstandings to occur. So in the, the Nature paper that I published recently, uh, we put together a whole series of data that we collected from different countries to find out how widespread some of these neuromyths are. And all of these things on the left-hand side here are, are false. Um, and this gives you the distribution of how many teachers in these different countries uh, believe in them. And you can see that <coughs> we only use 10% of our brain. That's almost half of teachers in, in all of those countries. Um, but of course, we use all of our brain all the time. All of the brain is processing. And if you ever have a part of the brain which is not functioning, then you have a serious medical condition. This, however, is probably the most um, virulent and in a way, one of the most damaging um, ideas in education, that we have a method of categorizing learners in terms of a particular learning style. And if you teach to that learning style, then they are going to learn more efficiently. We do have methods of categorizing teachers. In fact, there are over 80 different surveys that you can download from the internet or you can buy these self-report surveys that you give to the student, and they fill them in and they find out that they are a visual or auditory or kinesthetic learner. They are growing all the time. The latest one is how much of a boy learner you are or how much of a girl learner you are, how, much, how male or female your brain is, irrespective of your gender. And then once you've filled in that survey, there are a variety of products that you can buy which are going to support your learning. Now, unfortunately, none of these inventories, none of these surveys have ever shown themselves to be effective in terms of educational research. That's what the educational research says. There's no educational benefit in knowing somebody's learning style of any type. And 
the psychological experiments that have been undertaken have confirmed that and even shown that there's sometimes benefit in receiving information in a style that is not your preferred learning style. The neuroscience tells us that the brain is so interconnected that such an idea of categorizing people in terms of left or right brain or visual, auditory, kinesthetic is, is a bad starting point, right? You know, in terms of the biology, it doesn't make sense. Nevertheless, we also have other learning styles like um, down here, hemispheric dominance, left or right, helps explain individual differences. Whether you're left brain or right brain is another very popular idea which doesn't really help you as an educator. Um, this is from uh, Brain Gym, the idea that if you carry out coordination exercises or if you rub your brain buttons, uh, it's going to integrate your left and right hemisphere. There's really no support uh, for the effectiveness of that approach. Um, yet you can see it's very popular across all of these different countries. And some of these things sort of make sense in so far as they, they resonate with our suspicions. And we see children coming in having had sugary snacks or drinks, and they appear to be misbehaving. Um, and so we think, well, it's making them less attentive. But actually, sugary snacks and drinks can make you more attentive. Uh, for a little while. The real problem with them is that they rot your teeth. That's the real problem. Um, drink it, and this is one which is particularly popular in, in Britain. I, I don't know why. Um, I think it's because we've been sold um, a lot of water products on the basis that they're good for your brain. Um, but 30% of our teachers think the brain will shrink if you don't have six to eight glasses of water a day. But but this is this is the sort of th this one at the bottom is probably although although we only have a few teachers that believe in it or a lot more in China, um, this is uh, more insidious uh, if you like as a uh, it's more sinister uh, as a as a neuro myth um, because this idea that learning problems linked to brain differences cannot be remediated by education that suggests that if you have a diagnosis of dyslexia or dyscalculia which we know are linked to brain differences, but that means they are biologically determined and there is nothing that you can do about them. So how teachers think about brain development in terms of the genetic contribution influences their attitude in the classroom. And that's why I feel it's really important for teachers to know more about how the brain developments, develops and the role of genetics and the role of the environment and the most important part of the environment, if you ask me, is the school how that influences brain development. So this is a very quick anatomy uh, lesson. Uh, it's not going to get very complex, but uh, I just wanted to show you that, yes, there are regions that are associated with different modalities. So this could be your, um, you know, your, your somatosensory strip is here, and that's very important for feeling. Um, this auditory cortex, very important for processing sound. Visual cortex, very important for processing visual information. Um, but the brain is massively interconnected. So if you see a picture of a bell, your auditory cortex activates because you're almost imagining that you're hearing that sound, maybe. I don't, I don't know, but it's very interconnected. It's, it's, it's very difficult to talk about how one brain region operates um, completely independently of, of other parts of the network that it's connected to. Um, <coughs> and all the brain is active all the time. And if you take a slice through the brain, um, what we call a sagittal slice through the brain, and you have a look inside, you'll, you'll see that there is a very familiar tripartite structure. It's familiar in the sense that if you look at other brains, you'll see very similar um, three partitions to the brain, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. There is another myth that these parts have developed through evolution, so that if you look at reptiles, they don't have this sort of cortex. Um, and therefore, we call this the sort of reptilian brain. And, but actually, this is not true. It, the invertebrate brain has had this tripartite structure for 500 million years, ever since fishes evolved. And <coughs> actually, the midbrain, for example, and the hindbrain um, is very 
it's very connected to the forebrain in a sophisticated way. And when you make decisions, for example, whether you're going to a restaurant, you might be looking at the prices and doing some difficult calculations. And maybe that's going to take some parietal cortex or whatever. But actually, your reward system, which very much depends on the midbrain, is going to be activating as well. And it's very important for you making those higher level decisions. So, <coughs> and the other thing I wanted to show you here is that the corpus callosum connects the two hemispheres together. So this idea that you're, you could be left-brained and you just use the left-brained is really, is really artificial because both halves of the brain are talking to each other through this information superhighway all the time. So what's good and bad for brains? There's a lot of discussion on this and there's a lot of products that have sold us on the basis that they're good for your brain. Um, we have a lot of newspaper articles uh, in, our, in our country about the importance of water. And in fact, in one brain-based book, uh, they encourage children to sing to the tune of Frere Jaca, which I'm not sure I can do <coughs> with this throat. But you're encouraged to sing, Let, let's drink water, I love water, it gives me energy. This idea that you know, the more water you drink, the better you're going to get at your your schoolwork. And there is a sort of neurosis in our country. You see mums chasing after children with their water bottle to make sure they, they drink enough quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> well, it is true that 80% of our brain is water. It's true that mild dehydration can, in, can decrease your ability to think, that drinking too little water can be dangerous and even result in death. Um, and that people do feel more attentive after a drink of water. And there's a popular idea, we need six to eight glasses of water a day. We don't really know where this figure has come from. However, feeling more attentive is not the same as being more attentive. Research done at our university has also shown that if you're not thirsty, drinking water when you're not thirsty can also reduce your ability to think. And there is also evidence that, uh, and particularly um, well, amongst children with, with special educational needs, that it is possible to drink too much water. And sometimes, sadly, that can be fatal as well. So you're now thinking, well, should I drink too much, too little? And maybe you feel on a tightrope about this. Um, but, but luckily, we have brains that um, have regions in them that help us control our um, bodily stasis, our stability. And we know, unless it's particularly hot or unless we're undertaking exercise, we know when we need water because we feel thirsty. That's a function of the brain that makes us feel like that. In fact, it, it's very difficult to find evidence of where children have voluntarily become dehydrated when there is water actually available to them. And it is really important that children have available a good quality source of water that they can draw upon. Um, but the only evidence that you can find in the literature of where children are voluntarily dehydrated um, is in the Dead Sea region, which is one of the hottest regions of the world. Um, so it is possible that your brain can shrink. Uh, there is some evidence after a lot of exercise that the ventricles, uh, which do not contain grey matter, expand, um, but it's not linked to any change in cognitive function. The only really serious uh, case we have of brain shrinkage that has been documented, that I can find, is a man in Japan who tried to commit suicide by drinking too much soy sauce. It's quite an unusual case, I would imagine. Um, but they found that his brain shrunk. But after three months of carefully rehydrating this, this poor man, they found that the brain returned almost to its original size. Um, I don't know if you know what this is, but all these people here are doing something called Brain Gym, which is quite popular in a number of countries. Um, these sorts of coordination exercises, actually there's a lot of programs that use these sort of coordination exercises. So they're not particularly aerobic, they're not getting your heart racing, but there's a belief that by coordinating your thoughts and your um, hand movements that this is going to support your education, your, your literacy in particular. Um, in Brain Gym, for example, you're encouraged to rub two buttons that are supposed to be here, and that's going to coordinate your left and integrate, sorry, integrate your left and right hemisphere. But it's kind of like rubbing the radiator to fix your central heating. There's no process that can really enable that to happen. There's no physiology that could explain how such a thing could occur. Nevertheless, it's, it's incredibly popular. 
Um, Omega-3 is something else which is sold to us on the basis that it can make us clever. So you can have clever bread and clever milk. And our BBC also picks up these stories and tells us that uh, Elliot, for example, now, is now reading lots of Harry Potter books because he is taking fish oils. Fish oils is the common way of getting omega-3. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to show that omega-3 is very important for us, but unfortunately that evidence is, is more about before birth. So m mothers who eat a lot of fish um, can produce children with higher IQs, but that's not the same as meaning that if you take these supplements, it's going to make you more clever because it takes a very long time to reach your brain. And there are mixed results um, from giving supplements to children with some developmental disorders. So that's interesting. If we're getting mixed results, it's worth looking closer. But amongst the general population, amongst those who are not diagnosed with any particular disorder, it's very little, it's, there are very little effects. I mean, it's very difficult to find any um, effects that could confidently tell you that you're going to be more clever if you take more omega-3, sadly. And of course, a lot of these things are very attractive because they're so easy to do. Um, it's wishful thinking, and we're attracted to things that are easy, easy fixes. Learning styles, um, again, and I've talked about this already, um, very popular amongst teachers, no evidence for educational benefits, despite many, many studies no basis in neuroscience, and the, the scientists have, have really declared that this is wasted effort from the psychological studies that have been done. Caffeine, there is a, a myth that, that caffeine can sort of wake you up. Well, actually, if you're not a caffeine user, then possibly it can. But unfortunately, once you become a regular user of caffeine, it actually suppresses your cognitive function. And a regular user of caffeine includes children who drink only two cans a day of soft drinks. And sometimes they're colas, but there are other drinks that contain caffeine as well. And that means that if you're a coffee drinker or if a child is drinking two cans of cola a day, that their cognitive function only goes up to normal when they've had their fix of caffeine. Okay, and the rest of the time it's actually suppressed. Um, so we commonly see symptoms of um, caffeine withdrawal in children, and, and you may have experienced them yourself as an adult, You're getting the headaches, getting the sleepiness. Um, and it's something possibly we need to take more seriously, especially now we have these very highly caffeinated drinks. And, and one of these, for example, is equivalent to about three cups of coffee. So you only need to be having one of those a day uh, to be feeling the effect of that cognitive suppression. <clears throat> However, some of the things, as I've already mentioned, that really worry me are more subtle issues. And it's not just teachers that suffer neuromyths, it's also educational policy makers as well. And for a long time, uh, we have begun to take more seriously the importance of early years education, as we should have done, because for many decades, we did not understand how important the early years are. However, in the last 10 years or so, um, neuroscience has been used to make that case economically in terms of where funds should go. And sometimes the neuroscience has been used to produce very simple graphs like this about the return on investment in education. And what this graph is telling you here, this is the return per marginal pound, euro, dollar, whatever. And it's basically saying, look, after the age of three, it's hardly worth investing in a child. <laughs> now, that, that is not a good message. And you can, you can see it very clearly, because what people are saying in this graph is, look, this is where we're putting our money, and this is the return that you get economically from an equation that is supposed to be based on neuroscience. And neuroscience cannot support that sort of model. The neuroscience that is being used draws on the idea of the sensitive window of development. Now, we do have sensitive windows of development. For example, 
Before the age of one, if you have not heard particular sounds, you will find it more difficult to identify them and to learn them. So it took me a long time to learn Russian because there are sounds in Russian that I'd never heard when I was a baby. But I could do it eventually. So there are windows of sensitivity in terms of language development, but these windows are quite that we know about are, involve quite primary function, such as uh, perception and motor functions. And it is highly likely that there are also sensitive windows during adolescence. But these are going to involve much more complex functions. For example, identity seems a highly likely one. And we can see from the circumstantial evidence in the neuroscience that these windows are highly likely to exist, but we don't really have the methodologies and techniques to identify them. We've been more successful at finding these sensitive windows amongst younger children. So the message is that all of childhood, up until the late teenage years, is actually a special time for learning. And it is not possible to say that, that interventions should always be earlier. It depends what the intervention is and who the intervention is targeting. Generally speaking, if you're talking about cognitive function and children who are disadvantaged or children who are suffering a developmental disorder or have difficulties, then that is probably a good time to be doing an intervention. But other interventions, for example, risk-taking, which is a, can be a serious problem amongst teenagers, doesn't make sense if we're thinking about that as the earlier the better. It just does not work. So, you know, it's very often here you see this, this is a, a very influential think tank that advises the, our UK government. And they're saying the Heckman curve, to which Alan himself refers, shows that investment in life produces better returns. This curve shows that. No, it doesn't. It's just a mathematical curve based on some very somewhat superficial reading of the neuroscience. So we have to be careful about neuromyths in government as well as in um, amongst teachers and learners, I should say. And of course, you know, this has been, th that curve has been incredibly influential in our policy making in Britain. Um, this is showing you a, a riot that took place when they reduced funding for higher education in the UK. And the minister for the time um, told me personally that this graph here is very influential in the sorts of discussions that are take place about these sorts of issues. So <clears throat> we have to be very careful about how we think about neuroscience when we come across an idea that claims to be involve neuroscience. There is usually some fact. All of these things are true. Learners do benefit from receiving information in a range of different modalities. That's scientifically and educationally sound. It's not true they benefit from being learnt in the, sorry, being taught in their preferred learning style. It's true that language is generally left lateralized, so it tends to involve regions more on the left than on the right. But it doesn't mean that it's good categorizing children as left-brained or right-brained. It's true that dehydration can reduce cognitive functioning but it doesn't mean that less than six to eight glasses of water a day can cause the brain to shrink. I should say, by the way, that in situations of heat, and of course in Spain, you have many more of those than we do, um, and also in situations um, where there's exercise, it is necessary to monitor children's uh, drinking of water, and that's important. And, and in our country, school sports days are very often held in the summer when both of those things are occurring. But generally speaking, in our sort of climate, certainly in the UK, worrying about whether you're having six to eight glasses of water is not, a, is not really uh, appropriate. Aerobic exercise is really good for the brain, but it's not true that rehearsing motor perception um, things, exercises, are, are good. It's true that the younger brain is more plastic. So that's a very important thing to remember. But actually, our brains are plastic all through our lifetime. And it is certainly not fixed at three years old. That is a myth, but it's commonly believed by many. So <clears throat> my idea about how these things form is that you often do end up with these seeds, these little scientific seeds, but you, you have these massive weeds that are growing up. Um, and they are allowed to grow because we have this gap between neuroscience and between education culturally. That provides this fertile space in which these things can grow. 
And what, for, what forms in that space is very much influenced by our biases, including emotional biases, because we just want it to be true, or our anxiety biases, because we fear, for example, technology is taking us over. So we, we develop myths sometimes about what Facebook is doing to our brains. Um, but you know, there is a, a warning here, because neuroscience is very seductive. And this was a study that was done by Weisberg, and he uh, his team put forward explanations to people without any neuroscience in them at all. Some were good, some were bad. And you can see that they can rate them as good or they rate them as bad. We're looking at experts now, experts who really should know their stuff. And they have no problem distinguishing between good and bad explanations for an effect. And then they put in irrelevant neuroscience and you'll see that the good explanations actually started getting rated badly because the scientists did not like irrelevant neuroscience in the explanation. But look what happens with the public and people who, who don't really know about neuroscience. They can also tell the difference between a good explanation and a bad explanation. But once you put in the irrelevant neuroscience, and this neuroscience has nothing really to do with the explanation, they just put in a brain picture or they refer to the frontal cortex, immediately uh, these non-specialists begin to believe in this explanation. So neuroscience has the ability to sell explanations. And so we do have to be a little bit careful. And if you hear somebody say, oh, it's based on neuroscience, don't say, oh, wow, then it must be true. Um, always say, well, who says? Are they a neuroscientist? And you can follow that up with the question, well, where is it published? Because I'm afraid even neuroscientists, particularly when they're off record or they're just talking to a journalist, will sometimes say inappropriate things, um, particularly about education, I've noticed. <laughs> so always say, are they a neuroscientist and where is it published? Um, are there any... Um, sh can I take questions about that now? Or should I have... Because I'm going to move on to the second part of the talk, and maybe you wanted to ask me um, about any neuromyths that you've heard, and you can say, is it true? Yes. Okay. So I've been asked about um, multiple intelligences. <laughs> multiple intelligences, the idea of multiple intelligences were, were created by, was created by Howard Gardner. His idea was to emphasize the, the the multifaceted nature of human intelligence. And that's a good thing, and teachers like that idea. And, and maybe it's a good thing to emphasize how people are different and how people have different abilities, different um, special things about how they think. I don't think he ever intended it to be turned into a learning style. And very often, you see multiple intelligences applied in this way. So um, the idea that we should think about intelligence in, in a very many, you know, many different forms, I'm not particularly worried about. But when it starts being used as a basis for a learning style, then there just isn't the evidence to show that it can work. And I know that Howard Gardner never intended it to be used like that either. Yes? In a similar way, I wanted to to make a comment on the on the Heckman Corp, because I believe that James Heckman never yes. intended to say yeah. that the investment thank after you. three years yeah. was not relevant, right? No, thank you. I mean, uh, that's a very good point. So uh, this this work, my interpretation and my concerns about the Heckman curve, have been published in Developmental Science. But before I published them, I had the, the privilege and the honour to present the paper in front of James Heckman, which was quite worrying because I'm a, a humble scientist and he's a Nobel Prize winner. Um, but he was an absolute gentleman about it and, and he is also concerned at the way in which his work is interpreted. And I have no problem with the economics of James Heckman, um, only the way in which his work has been interpreted and, how, and the way, you know, some of the way in which it's been used by policymakers. And I know that his heart is definitely in the right place, and he has worked tirelessly to emphasise the importance of early years education. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that. 
Okay, so let's let's move on. Now you can ask me questions about Neuromyths later as well. But let's move on to authentic applications. There are, I'm going to have to go quite quickly through these. I just want to convince you that there's some areas that we do need to be thinking about, things we know about already that are important. Um, neuroscience has gone some way to emphasising that using your fingers in mathematics is not necessarily a bad thing. There was a time when we used to suppress children using fingers. We now understand that, in fact, it's, it's part of how cognition is embodied. We are designed to think in terms of action and in terms of our bodies. And it's, it's not a coincidence that we work in base 10. We have 10 fingers. Um, and we now have some interventions that show a better awareness of your fingers can actually support your early number development. And that's an interesting um, step forward, I think. We're also learning more about um, the underlying numerosity systems that we share with animals, this ability to estimate number very rat rapidly, automatically, may bootstrap our formal understanding of mathematics. And so uh, this, what you can see here are, are yellow regions where the adults use to approximate, um, but when they are asked to do an exact calculation, they start using more left lateralized language areas because they're using an inner dialogue to think through the processes involved. But the fact that we use these uh, regions, particularly the intraparietal sulcus back here, to approximate is important because we are still trying to understand how children develop that, s that first awareness of number and why sometimes it goes wrong. And in, when we look at children who are having difficulties with number, we are gaining insights from neuroscience about how there may be a core deficit in that number ability, in that ability to estimate number. And there are now interventions which are showing some promise, although I have to say there is still a massive uh, debate about this. Um, anxiety is another area. Um, for example, <coughs> we know that um, mild stress can actually be good for learning when it occurs in the same time and place externally and in the same time and space uh, internally in the brain. When you're revising for your exams, if you're a little bit worried about your learning, actually that can be a good thing. It can make it an emotional memory, make it easier to encode. But during an examination, if you're mildly stressed, you're using more regions that are involved with working memory, that's your ability to hold information consciously in your attention. And that will reduce your ability to perform in your examination. And the more anxious you are, uh, the more this region activates, and that's bad news because really you only want that region to activate because you're doing your, your academic work. There are some interventions now, um, for example, writing about your anxiety, prior to a test, appears to remediate some of the problems in your performance uh, associated with anxiety. And these sorts of interventions have been prompted by a better understanding of the underlying um, processes between anxiety and academic performance. I mentioned some uh, interventions that are have been shown to operate and one of what for mathematics and one of the most interesting things um, here children are being encouraged to represent their answers on a number line by landing the spaceship and giving a physical meaning to the number that they are expressing and that improves um, number ability amongst children diagnosed with dyscalculia, that's a, a, a number disorder, but also amongst children without that diagnosis. And as well as remediating their behaviour, it also shows remediation of brain activities associated with that problem as well. And so there's two important points here, apart from having some ideas for new interventions with children, it also um, tells us that well, it gives us some insight into 
the extent to which children with and without a diagnosis of a disorder should be categorised as qualitatively different. Because actually, both for dyslexia and dyscalculia, the interventions that are being developed quite often work for all children. So that's kind of interesting. And we could get into a discussion here about um, how meaningful some of these phrases are, ADHD, dyscalculia, dyslexia. But from my understanding and my reading of the literature, I would say that there is um, very little neuroscience evidence or genetic evidence from the scientists to say that there is a qualitative difference uh, in these behaviours. Sometimes we look at pictures like this and we say, oh, look, the children with and without dyscalculia have different brain activities. It must be a biologically determined disorder. But no, actually, these sorts of neuroscience studies are showing us how plastic the brain is um, and how influenced it can be by the correct intervention. In reading, um, we used to have dual root models whereby you would either use a visual system or you would use a phonological system to read, we understand more that the different ways of coding sound and letters and spelling are all interrelated in a very interconnected manner and all are likely to be firing simultaneously and informing each other because the brain is a massively parallel system. Um, so the reading systems are distributed, they contain some redundancy. It gives us some ideas for interventions as well, understanding the different types of coding that have to occur. And ex excitingly, um, we find that uh, we can use neuroimaging to explain how interventions operate, a little bit like the mathematics study. Uh, we can see this one using a, a game called Graphagame, which is encouraging children to link graphemes, the written form, to the sounds. That after playing the game, they are better at their phonological decoding. And also, again, we see the brain activity is also becoming remediated. And we almost have a, a neural marker for the amount of improvement that we see in the behavior, suggesting that neuroimaging might become part of a design process for developing educational interventions. But we're also reminded of the many different um, components that are involved in reading and the importance of having multi-component interventions and the possibility of identifying individual differences in children's reading abilities that might help tailor those interventions to specific children. Exercise, now I've already said that aerobic exercise is really important, and I think this is possibly one of the most undervalued and underrelated um, pieces of knowledge <laughs> that we have. There are many different attempts being made to improve executive function, but one thing that does seem to work is exercise. Schools often justify exercise because it's good for your health, it's good for team building, but actually you can justify it in terms of academic performance because it improves your ability to think. And when, when we look at differences in brain activities of people who are fit or unfit, we see differences, for example, in the anterior cingulate. The anterior cingulate is a very important part of the brain for paying attention. You are likely to be paying attention more if you do regular exercise. And in fact, in this intervention here, we can see when we compare physical exercise with listening to a, a, an audio book, these teenagers did 30 minutes a day, and their response times are much faster after doing physical exercise. The executive function has improved. And we can also see well-established effects. Um, for example, three minutes of intense running, two bouts of three minutes of intense running can improve your memory for information that you receive afterwards, both in the short term, the medium term, and the long term. And that, those different types of memory are associated with different types of process in the brain, and we have evidence for understanding and explaining how that comes about. Uh, we also, I mean, exercise is one of the issues with teenagers, but there are many other issues as well. We're beginning to understand the teenage brain is 
is, is not like a child's and it's not like an adult's. It actually has its own stage of development. Excuse me. <coughs> I think I'm all right, thanks. <coughs> um, and one of the things that occurs during adolescence is there is a change in circadian rhythms. And that means that there is some biological excuse for children wanting to stay up later and being more sleepy in the morning and not wanting to get out of bed. But of course, it's not that simple because there are also a lot of changes in terms of the amount of freedoms they have. Um, they become much more interested in their friends and their opinions of their peers. But together, we certainly do have often a sleep problem with teenagers. And there are issues, um, well, th there have been various attempts to try to remediate this. And there are quite a few interventions in our country going on now under the name of neuroscience and education that are funded by the Wellcome Trust, which is a neuroscience funder, and the Education Endowment Foundation, which is an education funder. And one of them is on sleep. So they're actually allowing a large number of teenagers to sleep in late before going to school to see if it improves their grades. Now, they've tried this in America, and they've shown that you get less sleepiness and you get better attendance. We're still waiting to see whether it actually improves academic grades or not. We will have to see. But the two things which really contribute to a lack of sleep, other than circadian rhythms that we know about with teenagers, are technology and caffeine. And quite often, those are combined together. And attempts to try to do something about that um, have included a more cultural approach. So for example, getting the friends involved, getting the parents involved, um, conversations, uh, phoning up home to make reminders, the, these sorts of things. When you just educate teenagers about sleep, they learn an awful lot about sleep, but they don't change their behavior, it, it appears. Oh, and I should say, the reason I put this here is to remind me to say that sleep is not just about avoiding sleepiness the next day. If you lose sleep, you will remember less about what you learn tomorrow because you'll be more tired, but you will also remember less about what you learned today if you miss your sleep tonight. Because during sleep, you consolidate memory for the experiences you've had during the day. So it's a double penalty. So sleep is really important for learning. Um, it's complicated, though, and I wanted to show you this study, which I think is a great study, but we could really do with more of them because it raises a lot of questions. 13 to 14-year-olds between 6 and 7 o'clock were allowed to do one of three things, play computer games, watch television, or do nothing. And then they were asked to do a type of homework where they had to remember some material. And what we find is that Slow wave sleep, which is supposed to be the important type of sleep for consolidating memory, is greatest for no technology, less for watching television, and least for playing computer games. But notice this is between 6 and 7 o'clock. So if my children are only playing computer games between 6 and 7 o'clock, that's a good evening in my house. <laughs> so I was quite shocked by this study. Um, my worry is when they're playing computer games at 9 o'clock in the evening or 10 o'clock, um, but presumably that does much more damage. Um, but also, their memory loss corresponds to the amount of slow-wave sleep that they lose. So least memory loss for their homework if they're not doing any technology, m more memory loss if they're watching TV, and most memory loss if they're playing computer games. So all sorts of questions about this. What sort of computer game? Um, you know, does it make a difference? What would happen if they played it for longer? You know. So, um, yeah, involvement of sleep education interventions are beginning to show some promise. Um, but really, we need the engagement of social scientists in this because we need a cultural change. Now we're beginning to understand the neuroscience, the natural science. We need the social sciences involved to help us develop better interventions. Um, we're, I mean, spa um, spaced learning, where you 
space out your learning sessions is something that we've known about for over 100 years from the psychologists. But it's being given new emphasis by neuroscience because we're beginning to understand what happens in the spaces when you space out learning. And we can see activation in speech areas that suggests there is an internal dialogue going on, probably to do with the learning in those spaces. So even though you're not conscious of it, something is occurring which is causing you to rehearse what you've learned and consolidate it in memory. And there are many other things which I haven't got time to mention. ADHD, so many children are, uh, uh, sorry, so many teachers are teaching children diagnosed with ADHD or on psychoactive drugs. Those teachers, I think, need to know about the brain basis of ADHD and what those psychoactive drugs are doing in order to better um, integrate and relate to children in that situation. We know that when learners visualise something, they, in other words, they imagine it, they are using almost as much uh, visual cortex as they would if they were actually doing it, which gi gives you an indication of how powerful visualisation is as a potential learning tool. Working memory training and brain training of executive function, a really interesting area. Adolescence, I've mentioned, but there are many other aspects to it, such as risk-taking. Um, timing of education, much, much more. Too many things for me to put on here. But I did want to tell you about my particular uh, interest, which is games and reward. The reason why I've focused on this area is because I'm aware that we have many children who are not behaviourally engaged in the classroom. And, and we have an example here of a photograph of children that are not behaviourally engaged. If you imagine the teacher is standing over here, um, none of the eyes are facing forward. And if the eyes are not facing forward and engaged, I mean, it may be that they are discussing some educational concept or topic, but actually I happen to know they are not. <coughs> and if we don't have that behavioural engagement, we know that that is the biggest predictor, apart from socioeconomic status, that is the biggest predictor we have of educational outcome. Um, and yet we have very poor understanding of how to use reward, which we use rewards all the time in the classroom to try to improve behavioural engagement. But we have very little understanding of how they operate. I mean, this is one of the most recent studies that, we've, that was done, um, which was evaluated at the University of Bristol, where children were offered cash rewards for good examination grades. And it had no effect on the GCSE grades at all which if you're a parent, maybe that's a good thing. Otherwise, I'd feel a terrible obligation to offer my children lots of money. Um, but it also demonstrates that we don't really understand the relationship between offering rewards and getting academic results. But look at this lovely relationship. This is uh, remembering information. So it's, it's a type of learning, but actually there's good evidence to think that it's not just about remembering facts. But learning increasing... Um, as you, this area of the brain, the ventral striatum, increases its activity. In other words, although there's a very poor relationship between the rewards we offer and the results we get, there's probably a very good relationship between the way in which the brain responds to the rewards and the results that we get. So what we need to understand more about is the way in which the brain responds to rewards. And there are ways that we know we can Im increase that. For example, um, uh, when, when, when you're playing video games, there are very big increases in that part of the brain, very incre big increases in activity. And the, the sorts of increases in activity in the reward system that we see when people are playing video games, it's comparable to taking methylphenaldate or some amphetamine drugs. And that may explain why, um, and this is a very old statistic, so forgive me, but I haven't got a more recent one. But back in 98, one in five teenagers were potentially addicted to video games because they are so massively engaging. Why are they massively engaging? Well, one of the reasons may be that they offer a very rapid schedule of uncertain rewards, rewards that are mediated by chance. And 
let me try to explain the significance of that. This uh, monkey has been uh, trained to look at different visual patterns, and we are measuring the dopamine uptake in the midbrain region. Some of these visual patterns it's seen before, and some it's never seen before. If, and sometimes, um, when it sees a particular type of visual pattern, it knows it's going to get a reward because it always received a reward when it saw that visual pattern in the past. So that is 100%, probability of 1.0, when it sees a reward that has always been, sorry, when it sees a pattern that has always been associated with reward. When it sees that pattern, it gets a spike of dopamine. But when the reward actually arrives, you can see that's the reward arriving there, there's no increase in dopamine because reward response is all based on expectations. So it sees the reward and that it sees the pattern. As soon as it knows it's going to get the reward, that's when you get the response. That's when you get the midbrain dopamine uptake but you don't see it when the reward actually arises. Now, you take this pattern down here. Um, this pattern is not associated with reward at all. So when it appears on the screen, there's no spike of dopamine. But when a reward arrives unexpectedly, you get that spike. Oh, yes, I do want that. Thank you very much. Because this signal is all about wanting something. It's not about pleasure. It's about wanting. And yet, when it, and the most interesting thing is when it sees a pattern that on half the occasions has been associated with a reward and on half the occasions has not, then, this is an uncertain reward, then it gets a spike of dopamine as if it knows it's going to get the reward, and then the dopamine ramps up until the outcome is known. Now, that means if you integrate over time, there is more midbrain dopamine for uncertain reward than either totally expected reward or totally unexpected reward. So uncertain rewards stimulate the reward system much more. And yet we don't really do that in schools. Most of the time we like children to know they're going to get a reward if they do the work. Um, so we, we tried this out uh, in various different ways, um, offering uncertain rewards. Now what do I mean by that? Uh, I'll give you an example. If I give you a question, I could say, if you get this correct, you can have a point. But in these types of intervention, I'm actually saying, no, if you get this correct, we'll spin a wheel or we'll toss a coin. And if it's heads, you get two points. And if it's tails, you get no points at all. That appears to be more motivating than if I just offer you a point for a correct answer. And We've actually been developing this approach with teachers. We've been testing it out. This is quite interesting because this is where we tested it out with adults. And what we found was that not just seeing the coin being tossed gives the emotional response, but also the answering of the question. There is a greater emotional response when you are answering the question in that context, in a gaming context, with uncertain reward than certain reward. In other words, the uncertain reward transforms the emotional experience of tackling the academic task. Now, we were worried about this because we thought the children would be saying, well, this is really unfair because suddenly a child's achievement in terms of the number of points is no longer completely predicted by whether they get correct answers or not. So we thought they'd be saying, oh, this is really unfair, but they didn't. Um, in fact, there were no questions about fairness. It was really about sport talk. So if the children were not doing very well, and remember you need learning and luck to do well, but if they're not doing very well, they would say, well, we're just really unlucky. But if they were doing well, then they would say, well, we're absolutely brilliant. So they would take attribution when they'd done well, but were able to dismiss the issue when they'd done badly. And that meant that they maintained their motivation um, throughout the lessons. We didn't know how you respond when you see somebody else get a reward, so we had to carry out a neuroimaging study to look at that. And, and what we found um, was actually that you respond to your competitor's unexpected failure. Okay, now you might not think that that's particularly surprising, but it kind of conflicts with some of what we understood about neuroscience at the time. So it was a good thing to do the study. So whether it's you that's 
getting the unexpected rewards or somebody else that's getting unexpected rewards, there is this increase in uptake of dopamine from the midbrain. Um, and this is actually implemented in a, an app that you can play um, on Zondel. So this is, uh, at the moment, it's free, although I've got a horrible feeling they're going to start charging soon. Um, but you can play this with your, with your students, and the students can respond using mobile phones, and it allows the teacher to remain at the centre of the classroom whilst all the children using laptops, iPods, or anything connected to the net are all responding together. Now, of course, just that connectivity can be very helpful in terms of learning because all the children are getting feedback on their answers. But also, they've got this uncertain reward, which is making the whole experience a lot more emotional. And it's being used um, in over 20 countries. And there have been two other studies that have looked at this uncertain reward effect and have confirmed our findings. And we are now rolling this out to 80 schools involving 10,000 children. Um, children will be experiencing a game-based approach for the whole of year eight. That's between the ages of 11, uh, sorry, between 12 years and 13 years old. They're going to be learning science entirely through a game-based approach. So every lesson will involve questions for uncertain rewards. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. <laughs> This is uh, almost, almost the final slide. I just wanted to show you that we are still carrying on with the neuroimaging research. And we've taken the conditions that we are looking at in schools. We're looking at the game-based condition for uncertain rewards. We're looking for a test-based condition using certain rewards. And we're looking at, at just normal teaching. And we've taken those sorts of conditions and we've been looking at them inside a brain scanner. And what we've found is that the more you gamify learning, the more you turn learning into a game, the more you get deactivation of this network. This network is the default mode network, and it activates when you start thinking about yourself or when your mind is wandering. So if I'm not keeping your attention and you're thinking about what you might be doing later, your default mode network is activating. But if I'd been performing this lecture more as a game, then that would have been less activated and your attention would have been more external. And we actually found that the more our participants deactivated their default mode network, the more they learnt. And there was much more deactivation in the gamified conditions, in the conditions that were a game. And, and that is um, currently under review uh, for a journal called Frontiers in Psychology. This is a huge issue because the language, the concepts um, and the perspectives and the professional goals of neuroscientists and educators are very, very different. Um, so that's why I wrote a book about it in a way. So I would, I, you know, and I, 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 maybe I could have written that book more clearly now because that was five years ago, but I still think um, that was me, in a way, trying to work through the, the issues that are involved. And I think we do need people who are trained in, in both areas. We need hybrid professionals. So we have started a Master's in Neuroscience and Education, an MSc at Bristol. There is also now one in London. But I also know that there are um, initiatives that are going on here in Barcelona, which are very exciting. And... So, so locally, there are attempts to, to bring neuroscience and education together. Um, and so I'm wondering if actually Diego should be telling you about those and, and encouraging neuroscientists and, and teachers to get involved with that network. You know, we have people who are making a lot of money out of brain-based ideas uh, that are very loud, very present in, in the discourse, but actually it's where authentic neuroscientists are talking to teacher trainers and to teachers that we are getting a joint discourse um, that, is, that is meaningful. Um, so there are now um, some books that are available. Um, for example, Neuroscience and Education, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, which is a, a strange book, a uh, strange title, but it's, it's a good book. It has lots of um, good stuff in it. Um, there's the book that I've written. There's a book by Sarah Blakemore and Uta Frith, The Learning Brain, which is very good. Um, 
And there is, our, there is at least two journals. So we have the, the Journal for Mind, Brain and Education, um, which uh, it was Kurt Fisher. Now there's somebody else in, in, uh, doing that. But um, so we have some authorities in terms of places you can go to which are publishing, which are, are worth reading. And we also have some networks internationally, International Mind, Brain and Education Society that publish, but also locally. And I think the local is really, really important because actually educators uh, need to make sure that their issues, the things that they are worried about, are becoming part of, are really central in the discourse. And those vary from one country to the next. So the message from neuroscience for education in South America, where this is also happening, is very different. They have very different needs and issues compared with Europe. Um, in terms of my approach, I believe we need to have multi interdisciplinary research involving educators and neuroscientists all the way through, from formulating the research question to doing bridging studies, to doing, um, well, actually, sorry, formulating the question, scientific studies using fMRI or neuroimaging techniques that give us scientific insights that are closer to what educators need, the questions that educators have. We need bridging studies to look at the meaning of those concepts in the classroom. And then we need practice-based studies to develop best practice in the classroom. And all of those require different types of technique from natural science methods through to more experientially based um, action research type methods. Action research, neuroscientists haven't got a clue what action research is, <laughs> but it's very, very important in education for developing good practice. And we need to combine all those together. And even at that stage, it's important to have the neuroscience involved because you will be generating the concepts to communicate and transfer what happens in the classroom to other teachers. And it's important that there is a monitoring of that to make sure the concepts don't come off the rails. And I've, I've been able to do that um, to some extent with creativity, which I haven't been able to talk about because we haven't got time, to a, a greater extent with game-based learning. Um, just really as a model, to, uh, well, that was one of the reasons why I did it, to show that it could be done. We've got all of those studies in there. It's a long process. It's not a short journey. It's a, it's a long journey. Uh, but that's really what we need. However, there are still some immediate things that we can do, and one of them is to get rid of the, the neuromyths. Um, so as well as some interventions that can be used in the classroom now, and game-based learning, I think, is one of them, um, there are also n this issue of getting rid of neuromyths, and those things can happen right now. Well, so my intervention very much uses technology. In fact, we, we introduce it to schools as a technology-based intervention. I think because technology is moving very quickly and neuroscience is moving very quickly, my feeling is that it's, it's going to be technology-based interventions that take off first in this area. Because of the culture of technology and the culture of neuroscience, <laughs> I think they are, they are more easily combined, and also because much of what we know from the neuroscience is done using technological platforms. So in a way, it's easier to transfer the concepts. Um, so does, does that answer those questions? <laughs> please I know, cause please um, do sí. remind me if I've missed something. Fa, fa, farem una segona ronda de, de preguntes, si de cas, per, per donar una mica més de... per aprofitar el temps que ens queda. Flip classroom. Mm -hmm. Flip classroom. So I, I think there has to come a time when people say... It's really important for people to say they don't know sometimes. <laughs> and I don't know whether the flipped classroom works or not. I don't know what the neuroscience would be in that situation, and I can't really comment, to be honest with you. It's very popular in our country, too. Um, but I, 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 I honestly do not know whether it works, and I don't know how our understanding of brain function would feed into our understanding of the flipped classroom at the moment. So I actually have to put my hands up and say I don't know on that one. 
learning styles is, is a real worry because um, you know, my, my statements about learning styles are, are based on readings of the literature, but also on other experts' readings of the literature. Um, and at the moment, there really just is not the educational evidence to show that, that it is worthwhile identifying somebody's learning style using any technique that has so far been created. And I would love to see that evidence. Um, there may be one or two studies showing some effects, but in terms of there being a consistent um, approach that, that works, it just the evidence is just not there. Um, that is not to say that you should not differentiate. It is important to differentiate in the classroom, but I would rather see a teacher understanding their student in a much broader way using um, a more common sense approach in terms of the ability, their perceived personality, their interests, for example. So it's really important for teachers to change their teaching approach based on how they understand their learner. I mean, that's really Vygotsky, understanding where somebody is and then building them up and, and taking them further. My problem is with learning styles is that the instruments that are used just do not identify meaningful enough categories of learners. So if you find some evidence, please send it to me. <laughs> but at the moment, I just cannot see the evidence in the literature. And it's not just me. Um, there, are, there are other scientists who have looked at this and come to exactly the same conclusions. So, you know, our government... Um, the Department for Education, until 2007, was recommending the use of learning styles, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, on its website, the Department for Education. And they noticed in 2005 that they had no evidence to support that recommendation. And it took them two years to find a way of politically disengaging uh, without too much embarrassment. But now, you know, that disengagement has been made. But it's, it, it's true that around the world, teachers, governments have accepted this because it's easy, it, makes, it seems to make sense. You sort of think, well, if I know something about the learner and I know what they prefer, I teach that preference, it should make a difference. But there's not the evidence. So I'm sorry, but I would robustly... <laughs> I would robustly stick to my position on, on that, but I'm, I'm interested always to look at other evidence if there's new evidence. Our preliminary research in actually developing the gaming was based on a more action research approach, whereby we were working with quite small classes and just trying to change things to understand how it operated. And in those days, we were going from one subject to the next. We actually started with literacy, with special needs group, with low ability literacy, 13, 14 year olds. Um, but then moved on to history. I worked using it in design and technology. Um, and, and really, Anything, um, I think you can just about use any topic with it in terms of the principles that are involved. I think the, um, I think a, a question that is often raised, which kind of relates to your question actually, is is this just for facts? You know, I mean, if you're working um, with history dates then it's obvious how you can use it because you just have to remember the dates. But it should operate in, in other ways. So you're not just learning, but you're also improving understanding. But that depends on the design of the questions. So people think multiple choice questions are just about facts. They're just at one level of Bloom's, um, Bloom's taxonomy. And so in the fMRI study we did, we made sure that we hit all of Bloom's levels of knowledge and understanding, except creativity, which was too complicated for us to assess. Um, and, and, on, and therefore, uh, it's important not to think that this is restricted to facts, but 
but also to appreciate that the effectiveness of the approach depends on your ability to design really good questions that probe deep understanding, not just recall of, of knowledge. We've chosen science for this massive intervention because that, that's the one that you know, is probably going to produce the most interesting results. It's been tested by a Turkish group in published research in database knowledge, knowledge of databases from an, um, an undergraduate software course or something. Um, I think the Devonshire paper tested the approach using um, sex education, I think it was. Um, we've chosen science because it's so there's such a nice uh, range of different levels of understanding that you can easily generate and test. But it should be it should be appropriate for any for all subjects really. But it depends on the skill of the question designer. Um, so in our project, we are also now spending a lot of time designing questions because that is absolutely key. It's not just uncertain reward. There are many other characteristics that I like to be important. So there is a competitive nature to it, and there is also the fact that rewards are often escalating. But a, a, another theory that we're looking at is the role of action, which actually relates to the question about uh, fr fr from online about using the body more to learn better. Because when you're um, producing very rapid actions, especially cue-directed actions, um, you produce another neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which is also related to improve, it can be related to improve memory and learning. So it may be competitiveness, uncertain reward, the rapid schedule of rewards, the escalation of rewards, and action is also likely to be um, an issue as well. So we are trying to unpick those. In the intervention that we did with the fMRI study, we only had three factors, competition, uncertain rewards, and, and uh, escalation of rewards. Um, but th those, are, those seem to be sufficient enough to improve learning. So um, In terms of uh, quizzes and learning, you know, what, how come quizzes, you know, how can we be sure that quizzes are not just, how can we be sure they're actually doing anything in educational terms? Well, when we first started applying this research, um, we had a year eight science class and we did a reproduction and we had a, a great big wheel of fortune that we were using and we were giving out plastic tokens using uncertain reward and we had fantastic engagement. Um, and we tested pre-test and post-test. And that's, that's a really important thing to do, to see what the children have actually learnt during the lesson. Don't leave it to chance, find out. And we were able to show that they learnt absolutely nothing at all. <laughs> so there is a really important point here, because you can't go straight from, less, from brain scan to lesson plan. You need to work with teachers and combine what you know about how the brain learns with what teachers understand about how children learn and combine those two things together. And we, you know, I remember the head teacher standing at the back of the class saying, actually, uh, this is just like a Christmas quiz. And we were thinking, yeah, it's like a Christmas quiz, isn't it? How do we, are these children learning? We looked at the paper, no, they're not learning at all. And um, what we needed to understand was to, we have to exploit, you have to exploit that window of excitement. So there is a stage during the game that's built into the game. So you, you know when they have um, answered the question, when they've made their decision whether to game, and they're waiting to, for that wheel to spin, they're waiting to find out if they have the answer correct as well, that's when their dopamine is ramping up. And that is a, a teachable moment. And so we encourage our teachers to focus uh, and use that as a teachable moment. And as soon as we started doing that, then we saw the improvements in learning that we were looking for. So um, what we now encourage is not just to use it as a quiz. In fact, we tell them, don't use it as a quiz. It's not a quiz. It should be part of the lesson. And when you present it, 
uh, when the children are answering and when you're giving feedback, use it as an opportunity to scaffold the learning, remind the children and the principals, sometimes to differentiate um, and give some you know, extra support where needed, and basically have it built in to the learning. Otherwise, my guess is that it, it, won't, it won't work. You don't want bells and buttons and whizzes and whooshes distracting children from the learning. You, you've got to design not only the game and the technology, but also the pedagogical approach to keep the children focused on the learning. Um, and it certainly is a reworking of teachers' expertise and what they understand about, about learning. That is, that is the name of the game. It is not about providing... Neuroscience is not going to provide a simple technological solution that replaces any of that. In fact, it's going to make it more difficult. I can promise you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's worth doing, um, I feel. But, but uh, there's no shortcuts in this uh, at all. So we're, we're putting in... And it's very difficult because we're putting in a lot of time and effort into um, working with teachers to try to develop ways of transferring this expertise as quickly as possible. But we know teachers have very, very little time to do it. So we're coming down to using sort of 20-second videos. No, just 20-second videos, because <laughs> they haven't got time to sit there for 30 minutes. We, 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 you know, that is, and that is a big part of the challenge. I think the import, one important thing that neuroscience can contribute is a greater awareness of the significance of emotions in the classroom. Um, that's really important. Um, social learning, uh, interestingly, because of the rise of social cognitive neuroscience, we have a better understanding of the reward response that you feel, that the reward response, the response to the brain's reward system, um, around agency, taking a choice, other people's company, sharing attention is a really important thing that we are gaining insight into. Um, the difference between intention and engagement is that attention may orientate children towards the board, but it's not what we're talking about, encouraging that deeper processing and scaffolding the children's learning. That has to come from the expertise that we've already developed within education that the teachers hold, and that's why the expertise of teachers needs to feed in to this, this new venture. Embodied cognition is a fascinating area. I think mirror neurons are likely to play a role in our understanding of that. Although there's been a lot of hot air about mirror neurons, actually, whether they are learnt or whether they are not learnt, um, the way in which we respond to another person's movement seems very significant in understanding their communication, and I'm aware that I'm doing that now.